Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter number 9. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Isaiah. Don't look there. There's a few books in between that. But. Isaiah, chapter 9. I pray for those who are traveling today, and then we have some that are traveling who are here. Amen. So that's a good thing. We're certainly grateful to have you. Uh, those of you who brought family and friends, uh, it's always a, a it's a compliment uh, to our to our church that you're here with us today. Well, tomorrow's Memorial Day. It's a time that we set aside to remember. There was a couple in their 90s. They're both having problems remembering things. Hey, they went to a checkup at their doctor's, and the doctor uh, looked them over and said, you know, you're physically okay, but you might want to start writing things down so you don't forget so much. Later that night, they're watching TV at home, and she gets up from her chair, and she says, do you want anything from the kitchen? He says, yes, I'd love to get a bowl of ice cream. She said, sure thing. He said, well, why don't you write that down so you don't forget? She goes, it's ice cream. I think I can remember. He said, yeah, but I'd like to have strawberries on it too. She goes, fine, I remember. Stra ice cream and strawberry. You really should write it down, he said. I'd also like to have whipped cream on top of it. She says, I don't need to write it down. I've got it. Ice cream, strawberries, whipped cream. He goes, I really think you ought to write it down as she heads out into the kitchen. About 20 minutes later, she returns from the kitchen and hands him a plate of bacon and eggs. He stares at the plate for a moment and he says, I knew it. I told you, you should have written it down. And you see, you forgot the toast. And so, forgetfulness... Forgetfulness is something that we all experience to some level, and it seems to get worse with age. Senior moments, we call them. Not Alzheimer's, but half Alzheimer's that we deal with uh, sometimes. Like the man who went to the doctor, and he said, recently I've been getting quite forgetful. The doctor said, well, how long have you had this problem? And he said, what problem? Uh, we've been there. We understand forgetfulness. It's a strange thing that we, there are some things we desperately would like to forget and we can't. And there's other things that we need to remember and we end up forgetting. Memorial Day is a day that's set aside to remember. It's a day that was born out of the Civil War with a desire to honor our dead. More than 600,000 people gave their, uh, soldiers gave their lives in that conflict alone. May 5th, 1868, General John A. Logan made the proclamation of Decoration Day that would be observed nationally uh, every year. It was observed for the first time that year on a Saturday, May 30th. Memorial events were, kept, uh, were held in 183 cemeteries that year, and the next year, 336 as it was growing. It was not declared a, an official holiday, until 1967, and it was changed over time from Decoration Day to Memorial Day. But we remember on this day the sacrifices of those that fought for our freedom. To many people, it's simply a day off of work. To some people, it's a day that you fire up the grill and enjoy some time with your family and some good food. But in the midst of all that, may I encourage you to take a moment to remember those who can't do those simple things. Those who cannot take the day off, uh, who are not around anymore. Think of those who died to preserve the freedoms that we enjoy today. The Revolutionary War, 25,324 soldiers. In the Civil War, 620,000 soldiers gave their lives. In World War I, 116, 710 soldiers gave their lives. 116,710. World War II, 407,316. In Korean War, 54,546. In the Vietnam War, 58,220. Some of you here had friends that are included in that number. The First Gulf War, 219. The Iraq War, 2,406 soldiers have given their lives, all fighting for our freedoms and our rights that we see today being eroded. It's a day we need to remember I want to start reading here in Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 18. We'll look at some more verses in the chapter, but we'll read these four. For wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, it shall kindle in the thickets of the forest, 
and they shall mount up like the lifting of, up of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, and he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, and they together shall be against Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. I want to preach today for a few minutes on America on fire. America on fire. Father, I pray you'd help us in the next few moments together here that we would not, we certainly don't seek to offend anyone. We certainly don't want to uh, be sensational in any way, but we just simply want to preach the word as it is and maybe raise the alarm on a few things that are going on in our country. We pray that you'd be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. It seems every year that you see in the news at least one wildfire in our country. It, what was once a forest is now a virtual powder keg of untapped fuel for that fire. Quickly the wildfire will overtake often thousands of acres of land, threatening many homes and even many lives. An average of 5 million acres burns every year in the United States, causing millions of dollars of damage. Once the fire spreads, it can <coughs> spread as fast as 14 miles per hour, consuming everything in its path. As the fire spreads through brush and trees, it seems to take a life of its own and finding ways to keep itself alive. Fire is a frightening thing, isn't it? Uh, in the Bible, we find wickedness compared to a fire. Isaiah uses this comparison in this text. And the reason I use this text is because as we celebrate Memorial Day this week, we remember those who have given their lives for this great country we live in today. And by the way, we live in the greatest nation in all the world. Oh, there is no guarantee, though, that that will always be the case if we allow things to deteriorate as they even are today. We see today America on fire as wickedness burns like a flame across our country. Today I want to make a comparison. Isaiah had witnessed the corruption of the Israelite people. He had seen pride overtake them. He saw them and described them as a burning like fire. And I believe the same fires that destroyed Israel may be burning in our nation as well. So there's several things I want to look at here in this text and some other verses that were going on in this time that I think we can draw reference to that's even happening in our nation as well. Number one, the people were filled with pride. Look at verse number 9, chapter 9, verse 9. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitant of Syria, they say, in the pride and stoutness of heart. The bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn and stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. God was sending judgment on the Israelite people. And they made two mistakes when he did so. They ignored the cause of the problem. Oh, they said, we'll rebuild. Hey, this wasn't a house problem. This was a heart problem God was trying to deal with. And they said, oh, we'll just rebuild and take care of these things. Not, not only that, they planned to deal with an external symptom instead of an internal problem. We will fix the buildings, but they did not address the fact that in verse number 13 it says, neither the day seek the Lord of hosts. Their plans were completely independent of God. We are in trouble, friends, when we think we can proceed in life without God. Proverbs 16, verse 18 Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. The Bible tells us in 2, Timoth uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. As we look at America today, we see an extremely proud people. They take pride in their own perversion sometimes, even having parades that they call what? A pride parade. We see pride all over in our nation. We have pushed God out of our institution and we've pushed Him out of our thought processes. One big change, Brother West and I were just talking about up here in uh, a statistic, 1958, 85% of people were in church on Sunday morning. Today, it's 22%. We are living in a continuing and uh, ex escalating godless community. Now, don't misunderstand. I am proud 
to be an American. However, I want that to be a healthy pride born out of gratefulness. And I think pride is okay in our nation and everything that we've, we've bought. You know, you can take pride in vehicles, making sure they stay nice, but always remember that the pride should not exceed that we still bow down to God. And so, I am proud to be an American, but I do not want that pride to be born in and of myself, which is the problem in so many today. I love the feeling that I have when I see a flag unfurled or a military band playing. Uh, we know what it represents. We know what it costs. And that feeling that comes up inside of us, that pride of being an American, because we understand what was paid for our freedom. And we don't ever want to forget it. That's why we have Memorial Day. We want to keep that in front of us. Now, the problem arises when gratefulness is replaced by self-glorification. In our own godlessness we start to credit ourselves for our own greatness. We ignore the conviction of Benjamin Franklin and others when he said, if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We show little concern for the tragedies that strike us. Abraham Lincoln said this, I quote, we've grown in numbers and wealth and power as no other nation has grown intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient, too proud to pray to the God who made us. Today we live in a society, friend, that does not need God. Yea, it even scoffs the idea of God. In our pride, we remove Him from schools and society and government buildings. It is pride that causes us to elevate ourselves and diminish God in our life. In the pride of our hearts, we even have a speaker of the house who claims while being a devout Christian that, uh, and advocates the killing of babies in the same sentence. This flies in the face of a holy God who holds life to be sacred. Psalm 127 verse 3, Lo, children are an inheritance of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Is there any wonder, friends, that we're in trouble? We're full of pride. Spurgeon said, in this excellent advice, be not proud of race, face, place, or grace. Pride is hollow and it is heartless. Like a drum, the emptier it is, the more sound it makes. That's what pride does. To be proud is to be loud. We see it in parades, as I just mentioned. Rather than being proud, we need to be grateful. Many have paid and continue to pay a great price for the freedoms that we enjoy. Let's not spit on them but let us be grateful for them. Not only were they filled with pride, the people lost their character. Look at verse number 16. For the leaders of this people caused them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. The concept is repeated in verse 19 where it says, no man shall spare his brother. This, there was poor leadership from the national leaders and there, that led to confusion among the people. We're in a nation now, by the way, that doesn't even agree on the type of leadership we should want. Right now, while I'm speaking, four in ten Americans prefer socialism uh, over capitalism and what we know. We're involved today, friends, in a war of values, a civil war of values. One that values life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then one that focuses on the redistribution of resources. Now, what is a value system? Well, a value system is simply principles of right and wrong that are accepted by an individual or a social group. That is why I'm such a proponent of Christian education because it offers a different world view and a different value system. The Bible demands that we identify and live by the right set of values. In fact, we have just spent several weeks here behind this pulpit talking about through the book of Judges how dangerous it is and how destructive it is for people to do right in their own eyes. We've seen it. We've seen a clear picture of it. I contend you cannot hold on to society's values and God's values. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters, for either will love the one and hate the other, or else you'll hold to the one despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And can I tell you today, friends, the world does not have our value system as based on the Word of God. Hollywood is not a good substitute for your time in raising your children. Government is not the solution to the care of your family. Yet even at we as Christians often partake in this and it draws slowly many away. This is the time of the year to reflect on just what our forefathers 
fought for. Benjamin Rush, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, said this, I do not believe that the Constitution was the offspring of inspiration, but I am as satisfied that it is as much a work of a divine providence as any of the miracles recorded in the Old and New Testament. Thank God for men, God-fearing men, that had a part in shaping this great nation. There's a character crisis in America today, straight from the top, and uh, we need to address that as we look at the reasons why America is on fire. There was a pride problem. There was a character problem. Number three, I want you to see in verse 13, the people turn their back on the Lord. The Bible says, For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Like Israel, we also have gotten to a place where we do not heed or need God's judgment. The Bible tells us in Proverbs th or Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Since her founding, America has been extremely blessed. For years now, Americans have been honor have honored and worshipped and served the God of the Bible. In fact, President Ronald Reagan said this, If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, we will be a nation gone under. And we have seen that happen very slowly. Gradually, since the 1960s, America has been turning her back on God. June 25th, 1962, the United States Supreme Court uh, called prayer in schools unconstitutional. Immediately after that, in years following that, teenage pregnancy increased over 500%. Uh, in the start of 1963, the SAT scores plummeted for 18 consecutive years after they removed God out of school. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And oh, have we not paid for it in spades. Between 1840 and 1960, that's a 120 year stretch, there was never more than 14 deaths per decade by firearm in our schools. Not, not long after the 1962 Supreme Court ruling, school shootings began to rise. On Tuesday of this very week, 18-year-old Salvador Rolando Ramos shot his grandmother at home, severely wounding her. He then proceeded to rob elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. For 78 minutes, he terrorized children and fired more than 100 rounds. In the end, 19 students and two teachers were dead, more than a dozen wounded. You've been watching it all week long. In the last decade, over 200 have died because of school shootings. You can't tell me that is not related to kicking God out of school. You can't tell me that when we turn our back on God, it will not come back and bite us in the end. Because we cannot live a life apart from God and expect to be successful. When we thumb our proverbial noses at Him and go our own way and do our own thing, who is to blame? It's not God. Turning our back on God will always result in judgment. I love this, uh, somebody wrote this, I don't even know who, who wrote this, but I think it's such a great thought. Whatever a man does without God, he will fail miserably, or he will succeed even more miserably. Our nation, friends, were not founded by a bunch of anti-God humanists. Patrick Henry said this, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. John Quincy Adams said from the day of the declaration, the American people were bound by the laws of God and the laws of the gospel, which they nearly all acknowledge as their rules of conduct. But how many Americans take credit today for blessings that we enjoy individually and as a nation, and we take the credit when God is the one who has been so good to our country. There, but yet there are times, we see it all throughout the Old Testament, there are times that God sends judgment. How sad it is that as a society we have increasingly turned our back on Him. Is there any wonder that America is on fire? We turned our back on God. In our text we saw that people were filled with pride. They lost their character. They turned their back on the Lord. And then number four, I want you to see that the people increased in wickedness. Look at verse number 18. For wickedness burneth as the fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns. It shall kindle in the thickets of the forest. And they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. We have a fire pit in our backyard. 
And as I, my kids grow up, I always like to teach them how to start fires so they know how to start a campfire. And, and uh, it's, it's pretty simple. There's really two ways to start a fire. Uh, one includes a whole lot of lighter fluid, which I won't go into right now. Uh, the other way that I recommend for the children is you put a little pile of very small sticks, maybe some paper underneath it, and you start that up, and as those sticks start, you add a little bit bigger sticks and bigger sticks and bigger sticks until the very end you can throw logs on that fire, and it'll continue. Uh, the, it, it progressively, as we move along, it progressively takes on larger items. And wickedness is like this. It's like a fire. It burns in a small way at first, then it consumes more and more. We see that in our lives, we see it in our nation, we see it in our homes, in our churches. Centuries ago, there was another great empire. It was the greatest empire in the world. In fact, it was thought the Roman Empire would last forever, could never end. Gibbon wrote in his Decline of the Fall and Fall of Roman Empire, he listed five reasons that the Roman Empire fell And I find it almost shocking how they mirror what's going on in our nation today. Number one, the rapid increase of divorce, the undermining of the dignity and sanctity of the home. There is perhaps no institution in America today that is under more attack than the home. From ruined marriages to rebellious children, Satan is alive and well. If he cannot effectively ruin God's first institution, or if he can effectively ruin God's first institution, which is marriage, then you better believe he can ruin the society that it lives within. And he can ruin the church as well. And so he works to chip away at what we call the nuclear family uh, with all kinds of, of perversion that surrounds it. And on top of that, we have sitcoms and movies and televisions that that, that degrade the father that degrade even the mothers sometimes, that elevate children, that promote homosexuality and all those things. I have a, I don't know who wrote this, I don't know the author, but I found it several years ago and I wanted to read this to you today. I thought this makes such a great point <coughs> that uh, might be a help to you. It's entitled, A Stranger in Our Home. A few years after I was born, my dad met a stranger who was new to our small town. Dad was fascinated with this enchanting newcomer and he soon invited him to live with our family. The stranger was quickly accepted and and was around from then on. As I grew up, I never questioned his place in my family. My parents, they were consistent instructors. Uh, Mom taught us good from evil. Uh, Dad taught me to obey. But the stranger, the stranger now, he was a storyteller. He kept us spellbound for hours with adventures and comedy. If I wanted to know about anything in life, he always knew the answers. He explained the past, he understood the present, and he even seemed to be able to predict the future. He took my family to our first Major League ball game. He made me laugh, he made me cry. The stranger never stopped talking. But Dad didn't seem to mind. Sometimes Mom would get up quietly while the rest of us were shushing each other to listen to what the stranger had to say. She said she'd have to go to the kitchen for some peace and quiet, and I wonder now if sometimes she didn't pray for the stranger to leave. Dad ruled our household with certain rules, but the stranger never felt obligated to live by him. Sure, uh, he, he, profanity, for example, was not allowed in our home. Not from us, not our friends, not our visitors. The stranger, though, he got away with four-letter words that made my dad squirm and my mother blush. My dad did, did not permit the use of alcohol, but the stranger encouraged us to try it on a regular basis. Not only that, he made cigarettes look cool. He talked freely about sex, and his comments were sometimes blatant, sometimes suggestive. Time after time, he opposed the values of my parents, and yet seldom was he rebuked, and he was never asked to leave. More than 50 years have passed since the stranger moved in with our family. He has blended right in, and he's not nearly as fascinating as he was at first. Still, if you walk into my parents' house today, you'll find him over there sitting on his, in his corner, waiting for someone to listen to him talk and to watch him draw his pictures. His name, we just call him TV. And the stranger has a wife now. We call her Miss Internet. Now, tell me, is there not a lot of truth in that? Undermining of the family was the first thing that took the Roman Empire down. Secondly, he said, higher and higher taxes and spending of public money for free bread and circuses 
for the populace. Again, is this not us today? Taxing the successful to make life easy for the unproductive? Number three, the mad craze for pleasure. Sports becoming every year more exciting and brutal. One word, video games. That's two words. I just didn't know if you were paying attention. Stay with me now. The violence, I'm not up here talking against video games and saying they're evil or whatever, but we do expose a lot of violence to our young people, don't we? And I find it interesting that almost every school shooter that I have seen and they've done profiles on, they, one of the things they have in common is they are involved deeply in very violent video games that helps them actually almost uh, question reality. Friends, I believe there's a price to pay for all this. Number four, he said the building of gigantic armaments when the real enemy is within in the decadence of the people. Number five, he said the decay of religion, losing touch with life and becoming impotent to guide the people. Not only is Christianity decaying, uh, it is outright being attacked in this country today. If you're a Christian, you have been called a bigot. You've been called crazy. You've been called weak and narrow-minded and a host of other things in the world today, in America today, I should say. Now, in our service today, we have right around 100 people here this morning. And just to give us some kind of perspective, if America consisted of 100 people, it would have in it two Jews, one Muslim, and 65 Christians. Now, Christians in this statistic included Catholics and Mormons. But the scary thing is what's growing, and that is the 26 what they call nuns that would be in here with us today. Not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E-S. Nuns, they don't believe in anything. They don't believe in God, they're atheists, they're agnostics. They don't believe in any of that, uh, anything beyond what they can see. And that is growing exponentially as we go along. But on the other hand, it reminds me here that uh, if you have 65 uh, out of 100 or 65% that label themselves as Christians... Why are we in such a mess if we have such a majority of Christians? You ever wondered that? Go back to those who are proud are loud. We are very quiet for other people. We don't have, have, when's the last time you went to a Christian pride parade? Any, anybody went lately? I'm not saying we should have them. I'm just saying we don't do that kind of stuff, see? We're not near as loud as wickedness is. And uh, there's, a, there's a truth to that, and we could go off on that. It's not even part of my message, but uh, it, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. All right, We need to be involved. By the way, vote. Vote. Make your voice known. Uh, get to know the local politicians and, and those that are, are trying to uh, run. There's a lot of good ones that are trying to run, and we need to get behind them. We just had an election here in Brookings a couple of weeks ago uh, where we far outnumbered the opposition, and guess what? We didn't show up. So the good ones didn't get voted in. And uh, that's a sad thing. We need to be involved. Uh, what can we do? Now, you hear a message like this. Man, you've beat us up for last 30 minutes, and we know our country's a mess. What can I do? I mean, it's easy to be like that crotchety old man sitting on his front porch talking about the days I lived in when I was younger is a lot better than it is today, and talk about how bad things are. That's easy. What do we do? Let me give you a couple of things before we close here. Number one, we can pray for revival. Pray for revival. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The answer to America on fire is God's people. The answer is not for a president to be elected who will legislate morality. That is not the answer to our country's problems. I like to see that, but that doesn't, that's not going to fix us. The answer is God's people. This goes against all of our complaining when we watch the news. And we blame the wicked for our problems. God's prescription is not morality. God's prescription is that His people are doing right in the midst of wickedness. Pastor Joe Wright gave a prayer before the Kansas House of Representatives back in January of 1996. I remember when he did this, it made nationwide news. This was his prayer. Let me just give you a part of it. He said, We have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and called it pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. 
We have endorsed perversion and called it an alternative lifestyle. We've exploited the poor and called it lottery. We've rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We've killed the unborn and called it a choice. We have neglected to discipline our children and we've called it building self-esteem. We've abused power and called it politics. We've coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it a freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. He wasn't invited back the next year to pray for that group, as you can imagine. But what's the answer? The answer is in God's people. When God went to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, don't, don't miss this now, the judgment was not dependent on the wicked people. You follow me on that? He said, if there's only ten righteous, I'll spare the city. It was up to the righteous, not up to the wicked, whether judgment came. He, he, of course, the city was wicked. That's why he judged them. But the, the coming, whether the judgment came or whether it did not come was dependent on his people. And guess what? His people were asleep on the job. All that time, Lot was there. And he didn't win anybody to Christ. He didn't, bring, he didn't influence anybody for the Lord. All those people, all that time he spent, he was on the city council and he couldn't influence anybody for Christ. Uh, he didn't. He was asleep at the wheel. It is us, God's people, that need to bring healing to this land. And by the way, it's not politics. Can I tell you, politics is downstream for cult, from culture. If we're going to live in a wicked culture, we're going to produce wicked politicians. It's just a part of it. They're not the answer. They're the result of a bad uh, uh, culture. We don't need more of a certain party. We need more redeemed children of the God of our land. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is not going to arrive on Air Force Run 1. The Bible says, and I'll break this verse down, if my people which are called by my name, there can be no finger pointing when it comes to bringing our nation to God. He's talking to us right here. We are who He is talking to. Judgment and redemption always begins at the house of God. Then he goes on, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. It's okay to be a proud American as long as we can bow to God. Amen? Uh, prayer is never obsolete. It's never outdated. It's never too late. We need to be in prayer for this country. Let me ask you this, friend. We do a lot of complaining about the nation we live in. I know I'm one of them. How much do we pray for it? Ooh, I think he's talking about you. Yes, I am. He's talking about me too. How much do we pray for our nation? He says, if they'll humble themselves and pray. And pray. When's the last time you bent your knee for this nation? Oh, how sad if we... Let, we, can, we can talk about wickedness all day long. And it is bad. But that's not what changes things. What changes things is God's people. And prayer is never outdated. It's never too late. And then he goes on and turn from their wicked ways. Can I tell you this, friends? We are notorious for repenting, but not turning. Repentance means to turn. Uh, re, do we love evil too much to turn from it? That's a big part of this. Turn from their wicked ways. Then he says, will I hear from heaven? God is waiting to hear from us. God longs for America to return to Him. More than you long for it, He longs for it. And he says, I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Forgiveness awaits all who turn. Uh, healing awaits all who turn. This is such a truth that I don't ever want us to miss. I know I talk about this verse almost every July 4th of Memorial Day, but we've got to remind ourselves constantly we are the solution to this nation's problems. We are the ones that need to get on our knees. We are the ones that need to make our voice heard. We are the ones that need to seek God's face and He will heal our land. Christianity and patriotism are hand in hand. It grieves me that there are churches, even in this town, who separate themselves from patriotism. Patriotism and Christianity are just like that. They're connected. Uh, My Country, Tis of Thee was written by a Baptist preacher, Sam, Samuel Francis Smith. The Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag that you said earlier, written in 1892 by a Baptist preacher, Francis Bellamy. In God we trust with, on our money, 
That was a suggestion by Pastor W.R. Watkinson of Ridleyville, Pennsylvania. Pastor John Witherspoon was a preacher who signed the Declaration of Independence. Listen, our, our nation, patriotism, and pastors and Christians are all interconnected in the beginning of this nation. It is after we've tried to separate them that we've had so much of a problem. Don't allow yourself to be separated. Hey, I love God, I love my nation, and I'll do whatever I can to help it to come back to God. Can America return to God? Absolutely, if it wants to. Do we want to? That's the question. God has given us a great blessing in our country. It is a blessing worth preserving. How? Through prayer and devotion to God. Unless we serve God, we will live in bondage. Is our nation burning today? Without a doubt. Is there anything we can do about it? Absolutely. He says, if my people, and then he gives us a list of things to do. As we celebrate Memorial Day tomorrow, and throughout this weekend. Let us remember the sacrifices. I love to drive, uh, as I drive by, drove, drove by quite a few yesterday uh, um, graveyards, and they had flags up, and they were honoring those that gave their life, and I love to see that. We need to honor them. But I have a question for you today. In light of the price that others have paid, can you just pray? Can you do that simple step? Pray? What would happen if every single one of us here are about a hundred people represented in here today. What if every single one of us determined we're going to pray an hour a week for our nation? That's 20 minutes a day. We're going to pray for our nation. What could happen in our nation if a hundred people from Brookings, South Dakota lifted their voice every day and asked God to do something for our land? We could make a difference if my people. When is the last time you bowed a knee for your country? Now, I want to, as I close, also remind you that on this day, I know this is not particularly what this day specifically is about, but I like to remember the one who sacrificed everything for our salvation. The difference between his sacrifice and the sacrifice of it made by our veterans is that this one is eternal. It is forever. They fight for our liberty, our freedom from tyranny. Praise God for him. Christ gave it all for our salvation and freedom from the consequences of sin, and it is eternal. Let us not forget the supreme sacrifice as we look at all these lesser sacrifices. I don't like to use the word lesser. There were great sacrifices, but uh, representing the supreme sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for you and for me. If you're in here today, friend, and you've never accepted the gift of salvation that your Savior paid for, would you please not leave today until you make that decision and make sure that's done. But today and tomorrow, let's remember our, the, those who sacrifice. Let's make a commitment to do our part to bring our nation back to God. America on fire, but it doesn't have to be. We can make a difference for the Lord. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm just going to simply open the altar today. I'm not going to really point you out or direct you uh, with any certain questions, but I'd just like to say, I, I, believe, I believe we should all really be praying for our nation today. And as she begins to play, would you stand along with me, heads bowed, eyes closed. If God spoke to your heart, would you just come to...